Why don't we stand as we open our Bibles to Luke chapter 11. We're picking up where we left off six months ago. Luke eleven fourteen. And if you missed last week's message, I do a little update on how things went over the last six months. Some lessons I learned, and that message is online. So if it feels weird, we're just jumping right into something and you haven't caught up with me yet, then you can catch up there. And then after the service, as I'm hanging out, um, I will be for, until I get inoculations, and uh, which won't be until next year, and until my immune system's stronger, I'll be wearing gloves. So when I shake hands, I won't get sick, theoretically. And can't do any hugs. And if anybody's had immunizations in the last month um, to protect me from the live virus that sheds after an immunization, like measles or whatever, um, you know, just can't get near me within a certain radius. So anyway, just some things to think about. So Luke 11.14. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, whom, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says... I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. At the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which, at which you nursed. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold something greater than Solomon is here the men of Nineveh will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold something greater than Jonah is here let's pray Lord, as we look in this passage today, we ask that you would give us that great insight and confidence in who you are as we walk this earth and face perhaps opposition and distraction and intimidation as we see in this passage today, um, that you would strengthen us and refocus our eyes upon you as the one who is greatest in the universe greatest in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Please be seated. All right, so it is summertime. How many of you guys have been camping this summer so far? Not many campers? Hiking? Uh, outdoors at all? Okay. <laughs> As you're outdoors, and uh, especially with your kids and family, you know, one of the things that oftentimes comes up is how do you find your direction? Um, how do you navigate if you're lost in the woods? You know, I have had all these conversations with my kids or sitting under the stars at night and, and whatnot. And so I was thinking about that and how important it is to know how to orientate yourself so that you don't get lost. And there are a number of ways Here's a little science stuff for you guys. A number of ways you can find true north that um, you might not have thought of other than a compass or a smartphone, which can be used, but it's important to know, according to NOAA, magnetic north is about 15 degrees off. So you've got to, on your compass, move that little... There's a little line, you can, you can put it at true north if you know where you're at and what the, the variation is of the uh, magnetic pole. So, 15 degrees off. But God made something really more accurate than that called the North Star. And that's one of the ways that we can find true north. If you were to look at or find the Big Dipper, also known as Ursa Major, and the Big Cup section... On the end of the cup, if you connect those two dots in a line and send a ray forward, it'll point to Polaris, which is part of the Little Dipper, which that's kind of cool, right? Big Dipper, Little Dipper, Ursa Minor. That star at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper is the North Star, and it's only one degree off from true north. And so at night, and for thousands of years, people have used that for um, navigation. Now, here's the one that is like I never knew till last year when I was reading about it. You could use the moon to find south if you're in the northern hemisphere. If there's a crescent, all you got to do is connect the two points and draw a line down to Earth, and it points directly to the South Pole. That's kind of cool. And so, by deduction, look at the South, and then behind you is North. Kind of nice. But if it's daytime and there's no celestial object to look at, you could always use trees. Now, around here, I'd love to just say uh, the moss is on the north side of the tree, but... <laughs> It's actually all around the tree, <laughs> oftentimes, anyway. So there's what I call the check effect. With trees, the branches that face south grow out more horizontal, and the branches that face north grow more vertically. So you can see, by looking at trees, you can make a check mark. And the longer part of that check points south. Is that cool? You guys ever know that? Pretty awesome. But even more simple, and uh, you see this in the Bible, is that people oriented themselves to the sunrise, to the east. And so I have a little sunrise. It's a little hard to see, but that's Hawaii from last year. The east side of Kauai, looking out at the sunrise. And so what you can do is, um, you know, when you see the Bible and the, the mindset, the worldview of those who orientated themselves, east was always front. So you faced east and the temple opened to the front. So the the temple door open to the east. When Christ returns, he will return from the east. And so where the sun rises is very important. Um, but interestingly enough, west 
which is the opposite of east, is the way they thought of as being back. So front, east, back, west, left, north, right, south. And so that's a totally different way of orientating ourselves, right? Uh, we think of north in the Bible. They thought of east. And that's enough of the science stuff. But anyway, <laughs> I thought that was interesting in terms of how important it is to find your place and where you focus, um, how you orientate your heart and your life on this earth. In the book of Daniel, when there was an edict put out that no one should pray except to the king of Babylon, um, Daniel was like, no way, I serve God. And so three times a day he would um, pray, and he oriented his life towards God. Look at this in Daniel 6.10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, where the temple was. And so in Daniel's mind, his center of the universe was God's house and where God was located. And though that be a physical thing, today we know Jesus said true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. And so when we pray, when we orientate our lives, God is the center. And so he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had, as he had done previously. Windows open for all to see. Because of Daniel's faith and his confidence in orienting his life towards God, he had strength even though this whole kingdom was against him. And if you guys know the rest of the story, of course, he gets arrested, and then he gets thrown in the lion's den, and he survives the night, and, um, you know, it's a miracle. God saves him. Those are the kinds of things that we see in the lives of those who orient their whole life towards God. So as you're thinking about your life, is there someone or some situation that's messing with your compass? Some magnetic force that seems to be pulling you off course, um, intimidating you, stealing your joy, making you feel insignificant or out of control. You know, the solution is not to fear or allow those things to kick you around, it's to reorient your life to God. Proverbs 1.7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know, if you want correct facts, a correct worldview, it begins with putting God at the middle. In Proverbs 9.10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So not just the beginning of knowledge, but also wisdom. If you want the skill in living rightly, it's found when we put God at the center of our personal universe. And so as we look at these verses that we read today, you might be thinking, what is that? Why, you know, there's so many different parts to that, and it seems though disjointed perhaps at first. But there's one thread I see through this whole thing, and that is that there is one who is greater. And so although there's opposition and maybe confusion about some things, um, it's always brought back to Jesus is greater. He's the center of gravity. And so we orient our life to him. So in verse 14, Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the, ma the mute man spoke. And the people marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Part of Jesus' ministry was to drive out demons. This particular demon caused this man to not be able to speak. Matthew, in a parallel account, also includes that he was blind. But as soon as 
Christ casts the demon out, he's able to speak and he's able to see. There's evidence that he had the power to drive out the demon because there's an immediate effect. One group, when they saw this, they marveled. But there was another group that criticized. It's not too unlike our world today. You know, anything happens. On social media, you get both, right? Those that marvel or think it's great, and then those that criticize. Those that criticize Jesus for casting out a demon here had two major angles that they argued from, why they thought that Jesus was a fake. And so the first thing they said was that you're only doing this by the power of Beelzebul. Uh, some of you guys might think that also of Beelzebub, heard that as well, but this name originally was a Canaanite deity associated with Satan and demons. Used as a name for Satan, meaning prince of demons. It's actually defined right there in the verse. The title was corrupted as a pun that also meant Lord of the Flies, or Fly God. And it was common use among the Jews in Christ's day. And um, the idea of being Lord of the Flies is like, uh, you know, you know what flies gather around, right? So, um, you know, messy stuff, piles of things. And uh, so Lord of the Flies was that kind of pun slur towards the prince of demons or Satan. Now, the other thing that they criticized him about is, okay, so you cast out a demon. It may have been by the power of Satan. So give us another sign. Give us something that this time, trust us, this time if you do something, we'll believe you. But no sign can overcome the unwillingness to believe. You know, read the Exodus story. How many signs did Pharaoh get? And he kept hardening his heart, and God hardened his heart. And for the person with a hard heart, there's always one more thing that they require before they say they'll believe. And so instead of pining over the person that will not believe and that it's your fault, you didn't explain it well enough, or you don't know enough science, or whatever it may be, Pray that God would change their heart, because that's the real key in that situation. But as it goes on in verse 17, But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will the kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they, they will be your judges. I love how this starts out with Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking before they spoke. And we see that oftentimes in his interaction with people. Before they could articulate their arguments, he knew their heart. And so he points out, hey, this idea that I'm doing this by the power of Satan is... Number one, illogical. Let's, let's become Spock for a moment. <laughs> it's illogical. Two analogies to illustrate the fallacy of logic here. Number one is a divided kingdom. If a kingdom is going to war, and that army, instead of being united in purpose and in force, are divided, they start fighting themselves and then the enemy just stands back and lets them fight. Because why lose your own guys in the process, right? And the kingdom falls. The enemy can move in. Another example that Jesus gives is not just a divided kingdom, but a divided household. If a household or a family is divided against itself, then it will not stand. So the argument of using the power of Satan to drive out Satan does not make sense logically. 
But secondly, Jesus tells them that their argument is self-incriminating. What that means is that there is, they're trying to use a hypo, or they're in hypocrisy using a different standard for Jesus than for themselves. Why? Because it says your sons, which means your followers, your disciples, they're going out and exercising demons. And according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, that uh, Jews in those days practiced exorcism rites that were handed down by Solomon over the centuries. So they believed anyway. But if casting out demons means collusion with Satan then their followers must also use demonic power. And so Jesus says, you know, this is self-incriminating. But we know that your exorcists are doing it by the power of God, and therefore, so is Christ. So their blasphemous accusations that Jesus is using the power of Satan reveals their predetermined, um, pre-just predetermined uh, decision. You know, they're biased against Christ. Now, verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Boom. He drops it right there. This is by the finger of God, or the power of God. Jesus was sent by the Father to destroy Satan's authority as ruler of this world. And therefore... The kingdom of God has arrived in the coming of Christ. You know, we talk about the kingdom of God in the Bible. Uh, the best way I like to think about the kingdom of God is wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. Wherever he's not, um, the kingdom is not. Jesus had arrived, and his very presence is the kingdom of God. And then the kingdom of God begins to spread through the message and through the power of what Jesus is doing. And so the kingdom of God was already there in their midst, before their eyes. They were getting a sense of the fragrance of the kingdom. They were getting some of the beauty of the kingdom of God as they watched in hearing Jesus preach. When Jesus ascended... The kingdom of God did not depart because in our hearts we know by faith Jesus makes his home there and the Holy Spirit indwells us. And all those who are followers of the king are part of this kingdom. So the kingdom of God is within us, but as you look around at this world, it's not fully here yet which is a bummer. It would be nice if it came before 2020, right? But one day the kingdom of God will arrive in its fullness and it will come crashing into this earth and all nations will bow the knee before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I look forward to that day. But then they were getting a taste of the kingdom. Today we have the kingdom within us. And one day it will be here. And with that kind of perspective, you know, reorienting your life to the idea that there is a kingdom that's going to last for eternity and put all other kingdoms to shame, then when we see that kingdom moving or we hear of that kingdom's um, mission, we become part of it and passionately submit and follow our king. So instead of criticism, there should have been humility and conviction and repentance and a reception of the king. Well, to continue in verse 21, it says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. So Satan is this strong man that has a palace. The Bible tells us that this world is his kingdom. He's called the prince of the power of the air and, and so on. 
and uh, he thinks he's hot stuff on this earth, uh, walking around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Um, he is intimidating, trying to, God's people. But Jesus is the one stronger, it says here, able to overpower Satan and his minions with his little finger. <laughs> it's not a huge task for him. Did you guys know there's no such thing as dualism? Dualism, which is the idea that like dark and light are equal and seek to balance each other out. Um, and so some people take that idea and think, well, Satan is like the dark power, and then God is like the light power, and they just kind of battle back and forth, and they're both as strong as one another. But that's not true. Satan is a created being. He has been defeated. But in John 1.5, it says this, and it's important to keep these kind of perspectives when we think about the evil one. It says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness will not prevail. So, as you think of Satan the strong man and Jesus the one stronger, realize Satan's just a, a little flea. And so, though Satan has a stronghold on mankind, his power has been broken in your life if you have put your faith in Christ and have been filled with the Holy Spirit. In 1 John 4.4, 4, it says, Little children, which is a really great way to address God's people, caring about them, and in light of false teachers that he's talking about in the book, in the enemy, little children, it's okay. You are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that he who is in the world is the evil one. So as you walk this earth, you have no need to fear the evil one, nor should we give him that power over us. But rather, trusting in the confidence that we have in Christ. And so for you as a believer, Satan's power is disarmed. His armor is removed. His authority is taken away. Amen? In verse 23, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. These are the words of the kingdom, king of the kingdom. In the same way that it was argued a, a kingdom divided itself cannot stand, Christ says, well then, in my kingdom, if you want to be part of it, you've got to Stand with me. And so, that question should be in our minds. Have you taken that stand to be with him? To not be with him is to be against him. There is no middle ground, he says. There's no fence in the middle that you get to sit on and, and say, okay, I'm just hanging out. I just want to check this out, you know, which it's okay to like, you know, study and figure out who is Jesus. You know, I want to pursue that. But there is no middle ground. There's no neutrality. And so you're on one side or the other. And these are Jesus' words, not mine. When a believer was doing in Jesus' name um, some ministry, in the Gospels, the disciples tried to stop him because they're like, hey, you're not part of our special group of 12. And then Jesus had to correct their thinking. In Luke 9, 50, it says, but Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. And in the same way, you know, those who are serving Jesus and have made him their king are also part of the kingdom with you. And so we find this unity based on the most important central fact that Jesus is that person's Lord. You know, there's, 
people try to seek unity on all sorts of things, you know, events or political views or, um, you know, sharing buildings or whatever. But really, unity in the kingdom is centered around the king. Now, as we think of that first point, this thread going through this passage, that Jesus is greater than the evil one. Is there an area of your life that you've given into fear? Thinking about demons or thinking about Satan or the evil that's prevalent in this world. And maybe you feel overwhelmed or freaked out. You know, I'd encourage you to begin to be strong and courageous in the Lord no matter what time it is at night and you wake up and you get the chills because you thought you heard something downstairs, you know, or you have some weird dream or whatever, I mean, go to prayer. Go to the Word. Um, turn on your smartphone. Listen to the Bible, you know. There's all sorts of things we can do to reorient ourselves when we start getting a little freaked out. Uh, or you begin to overthink things. And you're going through traffic, and the light turns red, and you're like, oh, man, demon of the red light. <laughs> you know, or I've got a cold. I've got to cast out this demon, a cold, you know. Sometimes we give way more uh, credibility to the enemy than he deserves. He's not all present, and he's not all powerful, and those things are kind of silly. Don't give him that. So Jesus is greater than the evil one. Um, the second thing we see, G Jesus is greater than anything that fills our life. So in verse 24, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. The last state of that person is worse than the first. Bummer. Gives you a little insight into what happens to demons when they're cast out. Um, they have no place to go because they have no body to possess. And so um, demons were thought... Uh, in some parts of Judaism, to reside in the desert, the waterless places, the wilderness, away from every form of life. But when that spirit, evil spirit, that demon, wants to um, have a person's body to use again and finds the, the one that had the spirit cast out of him, um, with his life in order. You know, he went to AA, got, got through uh, alcoholism, or is working on it, and got their life cleaned up, or got their marriage back together, or, you know, whatever it is, these kinds of things that we can change about ourselves. You know, we can begin to... Um, change the way we think, change the way we talk, change the way we act, kind of a self-reformation, if you will. But it's possible to conform to a certain kind of good person checklist and to be empty of God. And so we see that in dead religion. And we're going to see that as we continue on with the, the Pharisees and as Jesus confronts them and stuff, they've got all the order on the outside, but there's something missing on the inside. And so if a person has a demon cast out, and then they don't accept Christ and get filled with him, then their life is still open for things to move in. And so cast out a demon would be ultimately ineffective, without receiving also Christ. So what happens to us when we don't orient our life to Jesus and fill 
ourselves with him as the center. Romans 1, verse 18, begins to show you what happened to mankind when mankind said, you know what? I don't want God in my life. It says, for the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men by whom their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, just like Polaris in True North, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in these things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. There's no one that could say that they didn't know that there was... A God, although it may be proclaimed from their lips, their hearts testify otherwise. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. So notice how it goes backwards to the great one, to lesser things. And people begin to orient their lives towards animals and creation and idols and whatnot. And then it begins to affect their lifestyle. It says, therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And you can continue reading Romans 1, and you see this downward spiral of what happens in the heart and the life of the person that is void of God. Our hearts, as it's been said, has a God-shaped void. A vacuum, if you will. And we all know what happens with a vacuum is that that empty space demands to be filled by something. So it'll just go, suck it right in. One time I had this little uh, radioometer, this little uh, thing that spins when light hits it, you know? It's in a glass bulb. And it got knocked off my shelf. I like my little science toys, you know? And it, when it not, got knocked off the shelf, I was like, no! And it hits the ground and cracks. And then you could hear the, because it was a vacuum tube, you know, that the little thing is spinning in. Without that vacuum, you can't have that action going on. But you could hear the sucking action. As our hearts, if we send God out, then something will rush to fill it. And in this case, Jesus says, watch out, those demons will come back if you don't take care of things and accept Jesus. But I think of all the other things, too, that try to fill our lives. Like the fear of missing out. We've talked about FOMO before. The fear of missing out. The fear of missing out. So I know we canceled Netflix a little while ago, and then we hear, well, Stranger Things is back, you know? But at first I was afraid of missing out, but now I care less. I haven't watched the new season. But <laughs> fear of missing out on whatever it may be. Um, fear of missing out on the party. Fear of missing out on, you know, being rich or successful or whatever it is, and we can start pursuing those things, and they could take over our hearts, and before we know it, our life becomes oriented around something other than God. And we wonder why we are depressed and anxious, and we wonder why our life feels empty. Fill it with the wrong thing. It steals your joy. It kills your spirit. It destroys your life. As in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. 
I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And there's the answer for the void that is God-shaped in your life. Jesus came to give you abundant life, and if you put him there, he will fill you, and the enemy has no access. And so that importance of inviting Christ into the home of your heart. In Ephesians 3.14, this is the prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians. And this is one of my favorite sections of Scripture. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. That he would dwell is that idea of moving in to your heart as his home. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Who wants to be filled with all the fullness of the greatest one? It's through faith, Jesus making his home in our hearts. And so, for that to happen, sometimes, you know, well, it's... A one-time act inviting Jesus in, but as he moves into your heart, it's kind of a process where first, you know, he enters the front door and begins to hang out in your living room with you. And you've got the TV going and there's something that comes on the screen and you're like, oh, Jesus, don't look. <laughs> Let me change the channel or jump in front of the TV. Don't say it had to do that with our kids before and then I realized we shouldn't have this on but uh, as Jesus comes into your house and becomes a part of your life you start noticing those kinds of things um, you know which got hidden in the coat closet and uh, what's hanging out in your sink uh, how stinky your garbage is you know you start adjusting your life because Jesus is there and there's this cool little booklet called My Heart, Christ's Home um, that tells a little story about this. And what I like about it is at the very end, the, the guy who invited Jesus into his heart as his home, um, the last thing he did was he signed over the title deed of his house to Christ. It's kind of like the full, absolute surrender of everything. And so as you see this thread going through the second point, Jesus is greater than anything that fills our life. Maybe you've been um, out of sync. You know, you're disoriented because other things have come in and Jesus needs to clean the house with you and point out some stuff. And you got to put on the gloves and get the cleaning material and, and go at it. But when we let him have access, he will bring fullness of joy. And though you might not have a perfect life, the one that you think you should have, you will have joy, and you'll be filled with the love of Christ, and that will pour out into your relationship with your spouse and your kids. It'll overflow into your work into your neighborhood. So whatever's inside is going to be flowing out. Well, I had no idea I was going to take that long on two points, so I guess we'll pick it up next week where we left off. And uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for being greater than anything that has intimidated us or any being that seems powerful or scary Lord anything that has been stealing our joy and we come before you Lord and any of those things we've put in the void of our hearts we pray that you would remove it right now 
Lord, any clutter, any distractions, anything that we've started to love that we shouldn't be loving, certain sins and whatnot, Lord, we confess those to you now. Thank you that you died for them on the cross, that you paid the price. We return to you, Lord, in our hearts. We ask you for forgiveness. And Lord, we pray for you to move in in a powerful way. Maybe this morning it's the first time for someone that has been running from you and knows that you exist. Lord, if that person is in the room, that they would pray this in their heart. Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth to die for my sin on the cross. I receive what you've done for me, that you paid the price. I receive you as my king into my heart, that I might follow you and be filled with the fullness of abundant life that only you can give. Help me to follow you. Help me to be best friends with you, to learn how to love you. And Lord, for all of us, that we would have the freshness of that experience, the freshness of our salvation once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.